termed it a dhoti kurta budget <laughs> to counter the suit boot sarkar image that the opposition gave you. But you have a much bigger task ahead of you. Though the Indian economy is growing at an impressive 7.5% annually, it is still not enough to deliver more jobs, raise per capita income, and empower the billions. India needs to grow at an average of 10%, as China had done for over a decade in the past. This, sir, is the challenge we have thrown for you at this session. Given your formidable reputation, we have assembled the best experts to quiz you on the subject. May I now welcome on the stage Mr. Y.C. Dveshwar, Mr. Dveshwar, one of the most respected captains of Indian industry and chairman of the Mammoth ITC Group. Our next expert, Mr. T. N. Nainan, eminent journalist, a former India Today editor, whose verdict on Budget Day everyone looks forward to hearing, and who has recently done a brilliant book titled Turn of the Tortoise that looks at India's future. Mr. Nainan. And last but not least, Professor Sujit Bala, economist of considerable repute, someone who has an opinion on almost every subject, and recently added a feather in his cap by predicting the exact total in the Bihar election. We have adopted this very unusual format. And uh, uh, gentlemen, as you know, each of you all will get a turn to ask the question. And since I'm the moderator, I'm going to ask the first, first one. Arun, let's get to the topic of the day. How can you deliver double-digit growth for India? Well, I think you need a combination of several factors. When you look at the current 7, 7.5% 7 growth rate, Compared to how the world is doing, this indeed looks very impressive. But compared to our own uh, inherent ability, one always feels that India can do much better. Now, if India is to increase by 2%, 2% plus over and above our present capacities, I think a combination of several factors would be required you'll need uh, a supportive global environment because the present global environment uh, has its own share of challenges for India. Global markets are shrink shrinking, global trade is shrinking, and obviously our own exports is shrinking. There's a lot more volatility than we would have otherwise liked. Though the current scenario with regard to the oil prices is one factor which stands out as something which is helping us. Domestically, I think uh, the maximum potential to grow in terms of sector is agriculture. In terms of geographical region, it's the eastern part of India. And therefore, if you were to concentrate on geographically the east and sectorally agriculture, there's a huge potential for growth. You of course can do much better in manufacturing if we develop uh, an expertise particularly for low cost manufacturing considering that the wage bills in China are going up. And of course uh, you need uh, a reform temperament in the country. I think the good news is that the constituency that supports reforms today is much larger than it ever was in the past. It's much bigger than the one which obstructs reforms. And therefore, slowly but surely, we are moving in the direction where step after step you take, uh, 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 you move in the right direction itself. And therefore, if all the policy changes, taxation and otherwise uh, do come about in India, you have a better monsoon, we are able to step up investment both in agriculture and in the eastern parts of India. Private sector, and I think that's, that, that's also the key, uh, certainly can do much better than what it is doing today. Uh, 
Of course, there are several reasons uh, uh, for its curtailed investment. And a supportive global environment, I don't think it's uh, impossible for India to get uh, uh, a significant amount of additional growth. Okay. Nainand, you're short. Nainand? Sorry. <laughs> I'm going like this. Question. Okay. Um, Arun, uh, listening to what you just said, um, I'd like to turn the question around and ask whether we should stop talking about double-digit growth because it's unlikely to happen. Um, the global environment is not supportive. Uh, many of our real numbers are not showing up very well. We ourselves have never actually done double-digit growth. Uh, and uh, the incrementalism that uh, Arun Puri spoke about in his opening comments are not, um, are not designed to get you the scale of reform that you need to do double-digit growth. So should we say that this is really not something that we should be talking about just now, and even if we do 8% plus, we should be more than happy? Well, I think uh, 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 you have a valid point because realistically speaking, the current global environment is not a global environment where anybody in the world can achieve a double-digit growth. And therefore, uh, uh, the discussion really is theoretical. It's based on a premise that this kind of a situation or this cycle doesn't last indefinitely. And therefore, given the various variables, can we at least uh, aim high and improve? For example, uh, if you carry on some of the pending reforms that are still there, if you concentrate on some of these areas which I have just mentioned, if we are to able to improve the health of our banking system so as to be able to support growth, uh, your, your, your private sector becomes more oriented towards investment, then even if you are not able to go anywhere close to a double-digit growth, the prospect of greater economic activity and improving upon your present rates is always there. I think uh, there is a headspace that India has going by its own standards, though I, I concede to your view that in the current global environment, it's extremely, extremely difficult. Yogi, would you like to start? Arunji, uh, there are two impediments that are standing in the way of uh, investment cycle kicking in, particularly from the private sector. One is the excess capacity. Uh, Reserve Bank, uh, where I sit on the board, always reminds us that there is 30 percent excess capacity. And the other one is uh, tepid uh, uh, consumption capacity, particularly in the rural area. Uh, now, I, I think it's very heartening that uh, you focused your budget around uh, rural growth and you even went to the extent of saying that you would uh, uh, increase farmer income by 2022 uh, to double the present level. Now, uh, normally people would do some arithmetic and try and show you that uh, historically looking at it, it is uh, never possible. Uh, but I think the point here, as far as I can see, it is in envisioning something. And by envisioning something that is courageous uh, of this order, you uh, try and compel uh, a strategy and also align forces. Because if incomes in rural areas go up, then uh, it is like killing multiple birds with one stone. The incomes rise, there are very many social benefits and then industry begins to grow, the food processing industry and so on. There are multiple strategies. So my question here is that while the vision is very laudable, uh, what is your strategy to get uh, farmer or rural incomes to be doubled in this period, uh, short period? And many of your critics have done some arithmetic, which actually doesn't really matter, so long as we are heading in the right direction. <coughs> I think you, you have a point when you say that uh, uh, you are aiming high. You are setting a target which is extremely difficult and you are then aiming to reach the destination. Now a back of the envelope calculation by a critic would be 
that if you are to double your their incomes, uh, uh, is farm income in India going to grow by 14 percent a year? That's that's the point of criticism. Obviously, it's difficult, uh, uh, if not impossible, because Indian farm incomes, agricultural growth doesn't take place at that age. But then, you see, I am not. We are, we are not merely speaking in terms of income from agriculture. What about milk? What about animal husbandry? What about other areas that you would uh, want to encourage in these areas? Now, you have several states where rural income is not merely agricultural income. It is also income added from all these other sources. Now, one of the emphasis, and I'm extremely glad, I think this is a, 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 a very interesting development which has taken place, that amongst all political controversies, Economic issues now seem to be forming the center stage of, the, of an agenda in a debate. And one of the important agendas which the country by and large is accepting, instead of only industry-related reforms or policy-related reforms, this is an important expenditure-related reform. And therefore, you spend three times the amount this year on rural roads. You spend... Uh, a huge amount on irrigation. Though it's a state subject, the center is assisting it with all the uh, money that it's commanded, and this new fund that we are creating with Nabad to help in the irrigation project because that always brings uh, returns. Uh, if you look at the experiment of Andhra Pradesh during the earlier Congress government, Gujarat and more recently Madhya Pradesh, some of these states have seen a huge amount of growth in agriculture thanks to the investment in irrigation. There have been years where uh, Madhya Pradesh has gone up to 18 to 20 percent growth in agriculture in a single year because they were able to not only have minor irrigation projects but transport water from one part of the state to the other. So they've done it. Now states like Gujarat have added the milk income to it over the last 50, 60 years and added to that. And therefore, electrification, rural housing, uh, uh, irrigation. Now, all these expenses, when, uh, expenditures, when you incur, I think uh, over the ne this is not one budget, a one-off budget. Over the next few years, you'll have to concentrate your expenditure year after year in this direction. And if we are able to do it, from housing to toilets to irrigation to roads to electrification to irrigation, I think uh, uh, we are capable of significantly pu pushing up activity in the rural areas itself. I think Surjit has already taken his mic. Surjit, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me start with a confession um, that for the last three decades, every beginning of a decade, I have said that India should grow, has the potential of growing 8 to 10 percent. So I'm completely empathetic with that vision and with that goal. However, I've been proven wrong for the last 35 years, as Nainam would be more than keen to tell you. So what is it, <clears throat> and you've already admitted that the global situation is at the worst, if you will, in the last 30 years. So what is it that your party and you intend to do in terms of policies, in terms of strategy, to prove me right for a change, and if you will, for India, more importantly, to achieve its potential. So what is the, the big design? I agree with the emphasis on agriculture, etc. but what's the likelihood we'll get there? Surjit, I think uh, the idea is to improve upon our growth rates, even in an adverse global environment. Now, I don't uh, claim that uh, it's possible in this global environment to come anywhere close to a double-digit growth. It's, it's extremely difficult. It's or practically impossible to do that. It's only when the global tailwinds are behind you that, that it adds another percent or two to your own potential. But I think there is a lot that India can still do in order to improve upon. For instance, I took only a small step this year on my promise on direct tax reforms, settling all disputes, etc., etc., rationalizing rates, uh, bringing down corporate rates. Uh, I've only made symbolic uh, changes this year. And the idea was to express a determination that the target really is 25%. Even though if you recollect last year when I announced this, Parliament in the first instance didn't understand it. 
and the only point on which uh, I had some hostile noises is when I said corporate rates must come down to 25 percent. And when in the course of the debate I explained to them that corporates must have surplus to reinvest and you can't take, compete with global economies unless you have global taxation rates, slowly I think the political system started understanding this. Today, except one political party, which also now has started saying at least with one amendment or so we would like to support it, almost everybody else has come around, including UPA allies, all of them, the JDU, the RJD, the NCP, each one of them has told me that they will support the goods and services tax. So now these are some important measures. For example, today you are passing through a stage where because of the NPAs, the banks are stressed. And therefore, in knowing normally how Indian politics operates, it would take us a couple of years before we could probably draft an insolvency law and put it into action. I introduced it uh, in December. And while I speak to you in March, uh, the, uh, the committee has been working almost on by the day and promised to give me a unanimous report uh, in another two to three weeks from now. And hopefully in the second session part, I'll take it over. So I think there is a significant amount of change in terms of policy as far as Indian politics uh, is continuing. It was a, a law like Aadhaar. Now, it's taken us seven, eight years to debate it before we could put it in action. I announced it in this year's budget on the 29th of February. And today, as I speak to you on the 17th of uh, uh, March, within 18 days, it has become a law. I spoke in terms of some of the changes we were doing in the oil and gas sector. Within 10 days of the budget, they've already been implemented. So it's, it's possible in India to effect policy reforms. And I think, therefore, if policy reforms and the expenditure in the direction which I have indicated is probably the best that India can do under the circumstances, with, of course, uh, uh, one uh, big question as to when the private sector starts investing. Arun, uh, just continuing with the thought on politics, uh, you had mentioned you'd got through the Aadhaar bill, but the GST has been held up, and the opposition accuses the government of being intransigent, not wanting to talk to them, talking down to them. That's one of the uh, charges that has been. What is the problem? Why aren't you getting them on board? You see, first of all, uh, let us uh, speak in terms of uh, who's not talking. Today, every state government, including all Congress state governments, and I have personally spoken to each one of the Congress state governments, tells me that they are in favor of the GST. I recently went to the Global Economic Summit in Karnataka. The Chief Minister openly said that uh, Karnataka wants the GST. It, it, it's a Congress government. You have every political party in parliament which has said we will vote in favor. In the Lok Sabha, every party, Congress walked out, every other party voted in favor. The Congress party, now I read a statement, has only one issue about a constitutional uh, cap, which is a little difficult to impact because neither are tariffs decided through constitutional amendments. But the, it, it is extremely difficult to accept a situation that uh, every time you need uh, uh, to increase tariffs in a given emergency, uh, you have to amend the constitution. And we all know how difficult it is to amend the constitution. Normally, tariffs are decided in schedules. In the GST, where center and states decide together, the tariffs will be decided by the GST council, and therefore can't be decided by a constitutional gap. I think that's the only glitch that remains. I would still like the Congress party to come on board. and. Uh, uh, I can easily see, and this is going to happen in this phase of the biennial elections, the numbers are significantly changing. And in any case, uh, I am reasonably confident that the numbers in the upper house now also are in favor of the GST. Nainan, would you like to pick up the thread from there? Um, Arun, in your, um, I think in the BJP election manifesto two years ago, uh, it talked about the middle class and the new middle class. In your first budget, you spoke about the middle class and the new middle class. But in your third budget, 
uh, all the words are about the oppressed, the vulnerable, the poor. Your own comments about the scope being really in agriculture and in eastern India suggests um, there's a significant shift of emphasis in what your government is seeking to do at a time when I think it is fair to say that business by and large is disappointed with what it's seen from your government. So how would you react to that? I think uh, the emphasis is the correct one because one of the objects of policy and a budget being an opportunity for policy also is to fill in the pits where you, where you can see them. And uh, one of the big holes as far as the Indian economy is concerned was agrarian India and last two years of bad monsoon added to those problems. So the emphasis had to be there. Now look at what, what actually has, is being done. You need not sloganize it every time. One of the objects of, uh, and in middle class you help them through a taxation policy. That's the normal practice uh, that you follow. The first budget, I increased the tax limit by 50,000. I increased the exemption by 50,000. I increased the, the housing uh, interest payments by 50,000. In the last budget, second budget, I increased the transportation charges. I increased uh, the deductions on account of medical by a certain amount. This time for people living in rented houses, I increase the statutory deduction plus the tenancies I increase. So you keep by, in step after step, you keep leaving additional money in the hands of the smaller taxpayer. But I think one of the proposals that one unnoticed this time is hugely supportive of uh, the middle class taxpayer. In terms of businesses, that is traders, shopkeepers, workshop owners, I shifted with those with a turnover up to two crore rupees. I shifted to presumptive income. So you don't have to maintain books of accounts. If your income is up to two crores, if your total turnover is up to two crores, 8% is your assumed income. So you just have a three line return and you'll have a lot of surplus money. I now introduced and added the same to all the professionals. So all the doctors, the lawyers, the architects, the engineers who practice on their own. Whatever you earn, 50% is presumed to be income, 50% is presumed to be expenditure. You don't maintain any books of accounts. Now these two measures itself, this now accounts for a huge constituency of your taxpayers who are going to uh, now go in for this three-line return and have a lot of surplus monies available with them. So once you, the, this segment starts filing returns and no books to be maintained itself. So you always take step after step in every budget to add to surplus incomes in the hands of the middle classes so that they have more money to spend. So I have consistently followed that policy. The emphasis in terms of uh, uh, let's say an ideological debate, etc., on the economy. You had to shift the focus to the uh, the rural areas because that's where you need to invest. Now, uh, uh, Yogi Heads is one of the largest co uh, companies, so he knows unless that segment starts buying his products, his products are not going to sell. And therefore, even to help the industry, you need the purchasing power in that seg segment to be improved. Surjit, you wanted to interject. Sorry, no, go ahead, Nanand, if you'd like to. Do a quick follow-up. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, I, I think if we get reasonable monsoon, even average monsoon, um, that we will easily cross 8% GDP growth. Now, what has happened in the past is every time we start growing well, the government gets comfortable and, if you will, starts bringing anti-reforms. We saw that happening in 2007, 8, 2006, 7, 9, 10, etc. So what assurances can you give us that if you do reach the target, which I think is very, very reachable for the forthcoming year, that your government will not become comfortable? You see, just two observations on what you say. In the last hundred years, 
India hasn't had three continuous bad monsoons. So the law of probability is we've had two bad ones. The third one at least uh, should be an exception to what's happened. And I agree with you that uh, in case we have a good monsoon, it'll have a, if we had a good monsoon any of the last two years, probably uh, we would, it would have made a difference. I think there is one important aspect of this government. And not only of this government at the center, but I think there is a silver lining as far as the states also are concerned. A year and a half ago, I had used it more as a slogan, but today I can see this in action. There's a lot of reform activity going on in the states. So let me give, start by giving you an example of two states where reforms have conventionally never taken place, West Bengal and Kerala. Now, for the first time, Kerala started thinking in terms of giving ports to private sector and wanting some element of investment. So I could see some activity in the right direction. Last two years, I've attended the Global Investors Summit in West Bengal. The language, the idiom, the arguments being used in West Bengal had significantly changed. At least they had realized the importance of investment. Whether they get it or not is a separate question. So co competitive federalism between the states, I think this is a good point. The second, I think, as far as the central government is concerned, this debate will go on whether you take a, a large number of incremental reforms or you take Big Bang because nobody has decided, uh, defined what Big Bang is or nobody is capable of telling us. In a complex democracy like India, you have to steer your way through politics. I think the high point of governance in, and reforms has been that the direction is clear and every time you get an opportunity, you move in the right direction. For instance, Nainan said that uh, it was rural emphasis. But despite the rural emphasis, I can still give you seven or eight examples of major reforms I announced on the 29th of, uh, uh, of February. I mentioned the oil and gas uh, because of the pricing issue it had been struck, we opened it out. I, I found a new way of steering through Aadhaar, we've implemented it. I think one of the most important reforms which will come about is if we are able to push it this year, freeing the state transport from the, the, the permit system and amending the Motor Vehicles Act. Today, you go to state after state, you find an inadequate transport service, a public transport service, as far as the states are concerned. And therefore, if we are able to implement that, I think if uh, uh, this uh, reform in the food grown in India uh, the food processing sector, uh, uh, despite all the past debate to say, I will allow 100% FDI, uh, that food produced in India and uh, processed in India and its marketing, I'm sure to the kind of sector that uh, 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 these gentlemen look after is going to be a major uh, uh, support of that sector, which may also impact on, uh, on, on, on rural India. And therefore, each step is a reform but the direction is absolutely clear. And I don't think we've given any indication of uh, faltering as far as the direction is concerned. Yogi, uh, would you agree with that? Would you want a faster pace of reform? Which are the structural no. areas you would uh, like the finance you know, minister to focus I, on? I, 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 would, I want to come back to this uh, fascinating uh, socio-economic vision of doubling rural, uh, rural income, because associated with this is also creating jobs. Uh, before you came in, uh, Arun Puri said that we, you know, 12 million people are coming into the job market every year. So, uh, for this reason, for the last many years, food processing has been a priority sec uh, sector. But unfortunately, with this passage of years, uh, still, the total amount of uh, agri-produce that is processed is about 4%. And if you take away 35% of milk, that is processed in India, then it amounts to about 2%. Now, if you compare it with Brazil, which is 80%, or say Far East, uh, which goes up to say 40 to 60%, uh, it is abysmally small. And there lies a low-hanging fruit for creating jobs in much more secular manner dispersed all over India. And 
particularly where low income people live and where job creation is extremely important so what is the strategy to get this going point 1 point 2 agroforestry is another area you you mentioned animal husbandry and many other areas agroforestry unfortunately many years ago our government reduce the import tariff of wood to nearly 0% uh, ostensibly to save our forests as a result if we take census here how many people import their furniture from overseas you would find majority of people sitting here import their furniture from overseas at least i can tell you as a hotelier that all hotels import their furniture from china now if you want to create jobs in rural areas growing of wood through agroforestry and the carpentry which is really doesn't not a rocket science to create jobs we have moved away from the bound rates that wto permits and have made it nearly zero so that we have deprived rural india of those jobs so what is this government's job of undoing what was you know the done in the past to create an ecosystem whereby jobs will be created in rural india and really food processing industry as an instrument of creating jobs and rural prosperity would really be in the forefront and just to add to that in urban india as well what are the what is your plan for jobs for, for the young you'll have to have a, a multifaceted approach i think a lot of systems in india remained paralyzed now let me take the example you gave forestry now even when industrialization was taking place over the last 8 uh, 10 years the supreme court compelled us uh, to have uh, compensatory financing for forestry you have 45000 crores lying in the campa funds and nobody knows how to use it and therefore we've now brought a law one view was you the supreme court must decide how to spend it when budgets are not managed by courts they have to be managed by governments and therefore uh, uh, we decided to legislate and the campa fund legislation the committee's report has come and i think it's that entire money is intended to be used precisely for the work that you've said so we have 45000 crores of rupees lying separate from the consolidated fund of india which has been given by indian industry Uh, for compensatory forestation in india you you can easily use that now that once you have uh, the the economy moving particularly in terms of industry etc which at the moment is moving at a somewhat a modest pace you will also have a normal job creation but look at the kind of emphasis uh, some of us have placed now last year we realized that private sector investment is slow so job creation is slow so we perceived uh, for these millions of people the small uh, the mudra scheme in the first year we told the banks now instead of uh, giving these big loans have an emphasis on giving these small loans up to 2 lakhs and 5 lakhs and a maximum of 10 lakhs to these entrepreneurs all over the country and i'm glad uh, that they've touch a touched a as they're likely to touch a staggering figure this financial year of more than about 1.75 crore people i have rolled it over and increased the amount one and a half times this year from 1 lakh 22000 to 1 1 lakh 80000 crores in the next year and therefore you have small entrepreneurs being given monies by the banks setting up small units i went to some of the functions where they give these checks 70% of them are women somebody wants to set up in a slum a beauty parlor or somebody wants to uh, sell vegetables and somebody else wants uh, to set up a small boutique now this is a self employment scheme you will have to have ingenious methodologies of this kind to fund people startups i think uh, are doing well and they have to be encouraged in a big way in india this year for the socially disadvantaged the scheduled caste scheduled tribe and uh, women we've told each one of the private and the public sector branches that each one of you from each of these two categories has to create one each that's about 2 and a half to 3 lakh entrepreneurs 
by loaning them up to one crore. And our experience has been that the, the returns that they are getting, that people are returning about 99% of the money that they borrow. And therefore, the bad debts in these small loans uh, are hardly existent. So you'll have to come out, rather than on, only on big industry, on these small methodologies also so that people can generate their self-employment, be job providers to one or two people themselves. Uh, Arun, on the pace of reforms, uh, a political question. What is the RSS influence on making of the budget, on economic reforms, and is there a fight or are they with, with the government on this? Well, I must tell you uh, 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 that the budgets are decided by the governments within. I do consult a lot of people. We have, uh, all, these are almost public sessions uh, where we have consultations. And uh, we have uh, in those consultation sessions uh, trade unions of all kinds which come over. Uh, the inter comes, the ATEC comes, the BMS also comes. They have their considered views, but eventually the last word belongs to the government. You, you can't agree with everything that uh, different groups suggest. Of course, uh, what they said is some valuable opinions which are given, which we take into consideration. That's about all. No fight with them. There's no I major think, differences I don't that think, you have. I don't think... On I don't subsidies, th on... Uh, you you know, see, the on, on subsidies, uh, our policy is very rational and logical. We are continuing with subsidies, but our subsidies are meant only for the vulnerable. So you see, the first one year we showed the experiment in the case of petrol and uh, 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 diesel, we brought it to the market prices. As far as LPG is concerned, it's gradually now becoming a subsidy only for those who need it. So gradually you are having a lot of people being eliminated who don't deserve subsidies. Okay. Uh, Sujit, you wanted to button in this. Can you also ask about the pace of reforms? Are you happy with that? Yeah. Or? On the employment side, um, basically what one finds uh, is that people want public sector jobs. So we really don't have an employment problem per se, but we do have the fact that the public sector jobs, the reservations, the wages that the public sector gives is enormously higher than the wages that you get in the private sector. So that's the first part of my question. The second, related to this, is that you, your government has started a very good initiative in three or four states, in Rajasthan, in Madhya Pradesh, in Haryana, and there was talk of there being a national labor law being brought in. What are the prospects for that? Well, let me tell you, I think this problem of the labor that you are suggesting and which is often suggested in uh, uh, gatherings and discussions of this kind is being a little overstated. I don't see private sector in India in any way adversely impacted in a significant way because of uh, some labor issues itself strikes, protests, etc. are almost a thing of the past. It, it's very rarely taking place in some sectors. There are sectors where uh, 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 some element of reform is held up because you, uh, uh, there are still sense of insecurity as far as the labor is concerned. And I think slowly, one by one, we are trying to persuade them to agree to reforms in some of those sectors. For example, I have this year ventured uh, to enter the area of state transport uh, system. You couldn't have it because the state transport undertakings uh, had a huge uh, uh, labor issues. But once you do away with the permit system and you have all the private sectors uh, uh, or all private individuals operating state transport buses in competition with, the, with whatever the state transport buses are, I think the problem itself will dilute. Take banking for example. The banking uh, labor issues were very significant. But today you have private sector banks, you have internet banking, you have payment gateways, you have uh, 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 all kinds of banking activities taking place. So even when there is a banker's strike in India, the eventual impact of it has become quite minimal. 
take a third sector which was a government monopoly which is the railways now you have in infrastructure the private sector coming in you have uh, some of these locomotive plants being set up by even foreign companies you'll have the development of railway stations being done by private sector across the country so there is a significant amount of movement which is taking place uh, you had the port sector which was entirely a state monopoly so now your so called uh, 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 smaller ports uh, have overtaken your large uh, bigger ports because the smaller ports have become more competitive and they become much bigger than the uh, those trust ports that you had so i think the, the the market forces are being able to solve a large part of the problem and we've got time i think just for uh, two more questions nine you <clears throat> arun you mentioned that uh, the composition of the rajya sabha might change significantly um, in the course of this year do you think that might make the government more ambitious in its legislative program for economic reforms <laughs> you see what are the legislations which really remain now i i'll give you an example i think the most important one which remains is the gst it's followed by uh, the insolvency law i don't see a much of a problem on the insolvency law yesterday the second limb of the amendments to the companies act i have introduced because the 2000 companies act uh, amendments almost made uh, doing business in india extremely difficult and a lot of those uh, uh, uh changes uh, uh, were required in the act so i had brought in some immediate changes a year and a half ago the second limb i have uh, introduced yesterday so that remains S smaller legislations like i mentioned the one on camper funds etc remain motor vehicles act as and when we amend it in the course of the year will remain i don't think uh, there are too many of these uh, 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 laws that remain well, now that as far as the labor is concerned why did we amend the land acquisition act all the chief ministers wrote to the center when the new government came saying that the 2013 act has restrictive pro, uh, provisions they prevent growth please change it we acted on the advice of the chief ministers across all political parties the congress chief ministers also wrote to us once we brought the amendment the congress party wanted to make political capital out of it so the chief ministers were called again by the niti ayog what do you want they said now which, which one of the chief ministers wants to amend their own uh, state legislation is the center willing to tell us you will give assent to it we said we'll give assent to whichever states you want so the onus has now moved back to the states and some of the states one or two have amended it some are in the process of amending it we'll give assent to each one of the states and those who want the old law to continue then the investors will choose which state to go in arun i've just got uh, a request that the audience would like to ask one or two questions uh, please raise your hand there's only time rajdeep <laughs> uh, a very small question even as we speak vijay malia's house in mumbai is being auctioned uh, kingfisher house i wanted to ask this do you see vijay malia really as an absconder guilty of malfeasance and do you accept that vijay malia actually is one of many industrialists some even more high profile and even more well connected to your government who actually have even larger npas are you going to act against them do you believe it's individuals who are responsible or the banking system well, or the political me, system responsible let me let me not uh, give you an answer which you would want to sensationalize uh, <laughs> Uh, no, give me an honest answer. No, my, mine will be an <laughs> honest answer because uh, uh, I have to answer for sins my predecessors have committed. Uh, you see, the NPA problem is really on two counts. One part of the problem is because certain sectors of the economy had slowed down. So, if you analyze the NPAs, the largest are in the steel sector. which was facing a huge chinese surge coming into india there is some problem in the textile sector there were some in the highway and the infrastructure sector some were of the state governments the discoms in the power sector now these constituted some of the major npas now this is because of the economic climate and the economic factors which have taken place 
in these cases the sectors need to be addressed if you want to solve the real problem and we are we we've actually addressed most of these sectors there is a second category where large amount of loans have been given in individual cases and some of those people would have misconducted themselves there may not be adequate sureties and that's a source of worry i think these cases need to be segregated from the rest of the cases which are on account of the sectoral slowdown those npas which are a result of the sectoral slowdown once the upward movement in those sectors starts those npas could even cease to be npas but these are the ones which are the real cause of worry because there are moral and ethical issues besides legal liability involved in these cases uh, i think in the kind of examples that you mentioned just now this has brought a huge bad name both to india's banking as also to india's private sector and i think it's it's it's, it's extremely uh, dangerous for the future that if we are not able to remedy this now how do you remedy this i think our immediate job as a government is to make sure that our banks particularly the public sector banks remain strong so i am trying to recapitalize the banks the reserve bank has uh, two weeks ago taken a step in order to ease in their capital norms so which brings in more capital into the banks itself steps for change of management in some cases steps for uh, 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 sale of assets in some cases the banks have been uh, advised by the reserve bank to follow that policy the government agrees with that approach and i think eventually once uh, over the next few weeks we are able to bring the insolvency law there will be a structured statutory mechanism under which all this will be more easily possible but do you see mr malia as uh, an absconder guilty of malfeasance well why do you want me to make comments on uh, individual you had a full debate in parliament on it that's why i'm asking that's you where, right. where does I the have, government stand what i have it? to say what i have to say his facts are clear it's pending in court every government agency whether it's the taxation department or it's the investigative agencies wherever he has violated the law is going to take strong action as far as the banks are concerned i have found out the details from the bankers itself i have been briefed that they are going all out to recover every penny of the last rupee that they can from him i have been signaled that there can be no more questions thank you very much arun and our panel of experts for this please stay on the stage and give thank you gentlemen a big round of applause uh, while i call upon mr arun puri chairman and editor in chief the india today group to come up on stage uh, and uh, the bad side of the minister who will unveil our special edition of a coffee table book where we chronicle 40 glorious years of india incident a promising young kabaddi player was shot dead on the streets of rohtak in haryana what's truly alarming is that the fatal shooting was caught on camera on tuesday afternoon kabaddi player sukhvinder singh had of living a quiet happy boring life so i decided to get married and my wife says oh, welcome to hell boy but the episode ain't that bad it's just about all right above average